Today we have the million dollar answer to the age old question, just who exactly would be Jujutsu Kaisen's strongest student in their high school? Oh, contraire, my friend, we'd also be even learning about the weakest student that just so happens to be a Jujutsu sorcerer, with that weakest student being none other than Miwa. Miwa would be known as Miwa the Useless, and for good reason, because actually, she would just so happen to be very, very useless. Who would have thought? I wouldn't have. As I say this, she would actually land this spot for a very justifiable reason. Let's take her curse technique into consideration. This curse technique, new shadow style simple domain, would have a lot of glaring weaknesses. Understanding these weaknesses would of course come from understanding the technique itself. Miwa would have a simple domain technique that would cover a 2.21 meter radius that would go around her entire body and as you would notice she would be taking a katana ready battle stance and of course this would prepare easily the the best thing she could possibly do in any kind of fight by taking this battle stance anyone that would enter this 2.21 meter radius would immediately get attacked by miwa automatically so not only would this make for a complete offensive attack but also a complete defensive attack because if anyone were to come into your comfort zone you would just so happen to hit them and damage them at least that's what it seems like because of course this like i mentioned before does have quite a few disadvantages. She needs both of her feet planted on the ground, so that means she cannot move, meaning that once she decides to use this technique, she is locked in and she can't do anything about it. She has to commit completely. This would just leave her wide open to any attack, and it only gets much more worse than this because whenever anyone is supposed to enter this circle, they're supposed to be attacked automatically, but if someone is fast enough, Miwa will not even react and her automatic attack will miss and do nothing. So the phrase speed kills here is quite literal. For instance, when using her technique, she would try to cut down Yuji with him entering her 2.21 meter radius. But sadly, her attack would end up missing because Yuji would just be too fast for her. Miwa in this moment would admit that she hesitated, but with that being said, she would still have the possibility of missing an opponent regardless. With her being in shock that her counter wouldn't even hit him. Now going against someone that would be even faster than Yuji at this moment would be catastrophic for Miwa. We'd have another instance of Miwa using her technique, but this time her technique's own advantage would be used against her because when she would be planting her feet on the ground and anything inside of her radius would be blocked automatically, you can bait her into blocking a fake attack forcing her to block an attack that you weren't really going to do against her, then punishing her right after. Ranged attacks can really take advantage of Miwa's technique and put her in a position that she really doesn't want to be in. With so many weaknesses, it's only natural for her to be here on the list. And when push comes to shove, when putting her entire present and future into an attack, her katana would be broken by just Kenjaku's hand. I gotta admit, Kenjaku is in his own league, but putting your own present and future into an attack only for it to do nothing just ends up being downright pathetic. Miwa is arguably the best girl in the series, you gotta have other uses outside of looking good. Miwa the Useless definitely lives up to her name. Next we'd have a really interesting sorcerer with this sorcerer using conventional weaponry such as guns. Mai, the best girl in the series, who just so happens to use my favorite gun, <coughs> a revolver, more accurately a Smith & Wesson. But I don't think it takes a genius to see that Mai uses cursed energy with her weapons by focusing her own cursed energy into her bullets making her guns a lot stronger than any normal guns, of course. With that being said, you can expect a bullet with cursed energy behind it versus a regular bullet to have a significant difference in the kind of damage that they're gonna produce. As I say this though, there's definitely a reason as to why Mai is so low. Speaking of being low, Mai would have low cursed energy and so, you wouldn't really get most of the efficiency that you would expect out of a sorcerer using weapons like these, because after all, she can't really use them at their strongest because she can't put that much energy into any bullet that she fires. All because she has low cursed energy, this would also put her at a huge disadvantage against anyone else who has more cursed energy than her, because anyone that she fires her gun at, if they put more cursed energy into their own body to defend against any bullet that she fires, this makes whatever Mai does pointless. 
Because after all, statistically speaking, anyone with more energy is just going to survive against anything that she does. There's some more to even think about because Mai has to aim her guns at anybody that she's going against, and if you're just faster than her, she might not be able to even shoot at you at all. Now what kind of difference is her curse technique going to really make? You see, her curse technique would be construction. When using this curse technique, Mai can create an object from nothing. With construction, after creating something, it will stay even after she dispels her entire technique but as always there's a catch when you use a lot of cursed energy it will have a harsh effect on your body and so my can only make one bullet a day when using her construction technique otherwise it will cause her significant damage when fighting her biggest strategy here would just so happen to be a bluff as we know revolvers only carry six bullets within them and so after losing all of her ammo she would trick her opponents into thinking she doesn't have another bullet in the chamber unfortunately they couldn't be more wrong because she would construct a new bullet to shoot them with completely catching them off guard and killing them in theory this is the perfect trump card you can catch on anybody the ace in the deck even so this technique is held back by Mai's low energy, but also this bullet can be completely stopped. If someone is strong enough or fast enough, they can stop this bullet from ever hitting them. Just like in her fight against Maki. And like I mentioned before, with enough cursed energy, it can probably just be blocked as well. With that being probably one of her most dangerous moves, there's nothing she can really do, but she would also have a sniper in her arsenal. So the best thing she can really do is just catch you off guard. And if that doesn't work, she's already lost. She would be higher than Miwa because she could easily bait out Miwa's technique. And not only that, but I doubt Miwa is dodging and or catching any bullets anytime soon. Also guys, since you made it this far, make sure to like the video and subscribe to the channel. Your support allows me to continue to make content. Also watch the video until the very end. This next sorcerer caught me by surprise myself, with it being Inumaki because really you would expect a lot out of his curse technique considering he crushed Ghetto with it, even though I will admit, Ghetto came out alive like nothing happened, which was definitely really shocking. But when using cursed speech, Inumaki could say simple words and just imbue them with cursed energy to make them have insane effects that will completely take out his enemies. For example, he can say explode, and without a doubt, anyone he's fighting will do just that explode inumaki could say the command get twisted and will crunch up and break any of his opponent's arms twisting your limb around until you just can't use it anymore i can't lie it sounds painful when saying get crushed of course inumaki is just going to crush his opponents until there's nothing left and a very important command in case inumaki can't damage any of his opponents with his cursed speech would be blast away because his opponents would be sent far away from him giving him the opportunity to run away with his life Another way for him to get away from his opponents or even just beat you down into the dirt is by using his don't move command, which paralyzes you or, you guessed it, doesn't let you move. If he wants to, he can even make you run away just by saying the command as well. Now, these just so happen to be very amazing abilities and they just seem like they can one hit kill anybody that he comes into contact with. As I say this, he would use these commands and they would have their own sense of recoil against him. Every time Inumaki uses a command, it will end up damaging his throat, making it so that he can't speak and use any more cursed speech techniques. This is a huge disadvantage and would make any fight that Inumaki is in an endurance battle against himself, just so that he doesn't hurt himself to a point where he's no longer even able to fight. What would earn him this spot on the list is the very fact that any sorcerer could protect themselves by allowing cursed energy to flow through their ear and moving to their brains, making his techniques null and void. The best thing he can really do is catch you off guard, and cursed speech would be a technique that would work especially well against cursed spirits. Protecting your head so that you can no longer hear any of his commands, alongside him damaging himself, makes fighting him an easy guessing game. Here we would have Momo, who would specialize in using an environmental curse technique. Surprisingly so, for just a witch on a broom, she would have a lot of advantages when it comes to fighting. With the biggest thing being, height advantage. You see, when using the wind as a curse technique, Momo can set herself so high into the air that no one will ever even be able to reach her. How do you fight her? Well, guess what? The answer is actually simple. You don't. If you thought her camping in the air wasn't bad enough, she can even send giant gusts of wind, which can not only cut you and kill you, but depending on where you're fighting, gravel and branches into your face, which would only tear open your body and rip you to shreds. But all while this is happening, 
her wind will be pushing you away from her, making her fighting style perfect for keeping you at a distance. Who would have thought? If it isn't being 50 feet in the air away from you, it's pushing you away with her wind. Sounds like a hassle, really. But this wind manipulation would go a step further with her being able to actually control her cursed tool from a distance, leaving you vulnerable to any type of sneak attacks that she wants to do. Let's just say if you're not looking, she'll use the broom and give it enough force to hit you in the face. And if she isn't using her broom for tricks and deception, she's using it for brute force. When Momo is using her tool manipulation, she can use a move known as Wind Scythe and immediately you can come to notice that this attack might potentially slice anyone who comes into contact with it in half. Unfortunately, this attack gets blown away by Yu Rao Mei's hand just like that, and this puts Momo in shock. Wind Scythe itself must be pretty powerful, but it was actually just used against the wrong person at the wrong time. When you really think about it, Momo can do a lot of damage with just her aerial superiority alone. But I rest my case. Our next sorcerer is Nobara. With her tools of trade being a hammer and a nail, she can come over my house and beat my carpenter any day of the week. I'm sure she's going to keep a lot of zombies away. That being said, what exactly can she do with these nails and hammer? Oddly enough, even while having a weapon that you really wouldn't think would be used in a fight, Nobara would have a complete fighting style, which allows her to fight not only from a distance, but up close and personal. If you're not in Nobara's face, she'll take her nails and hammer them right into your face, with her attack being no different than a nail gun. Now, how exactly can she aim that? Your guess is as good as mine, but at least we know she's experienced. After all, we can pretty much recognize that she's really good with her hands, but for this next part of her technique, she doesn't really have to use those at all because with a snap of a finger, after any of her nails hit their target, she can concentrate her cursed energy into them and make it so that they pierce anyone that she's going up against by simply flowing her cursed energy through these objects. She can make them completely stronger than what they would normally be. Don't be fooled just yet because Nobara would actually have a lot more tricks up her sleeve, literally, with her special ability being her straw doll technique. Much like a voodoo doll, well, exactly like a voodoo doll, if Nobara were to do anything to the straw doll while having a piece of anybody, whether it be their arm or a piece of their hair, due to their strong connection, Nobara could create a resonance and make whatever happens to the doll happen to anyone she wants. Just to keep it simple, let's just say if she were to hurt the heart of this straw doll, the damage that was inflicted on the doll would happen to who she wants. More accurately, whoever she has a piece of. The next step of this technique would be by increasing her connection to anyone. By having a stronger connection, let's just say, rather than using the doll, she could use her entire body and damage herself in order to damage other people. This would literally only be possible through certain circumstances that can cause her to be connected with anyone else. And once Nobara would pin a nail into somebody's body, she can use her hairpin technique, which focuses her cursed energy. What makes hairpin special is the very fact that unlike just flowing cursed energy through this nail, this nail would end up exploding and piercing and expanding through anyone that it resides in, killing them in one fell swoop. And really, if Nobara's abilities weren't anything to be afraid of, you could really just pay attention to how psychotic she is because when she would attack an enemy like Mahito, she would intentionally miss him just to set him up for an attack that will give him heavy damage. It may not seem like it, but Nobara really does just always think one step ahead. So much so that she would even trick Mahito twice, but even go as far as to finding a strategy to use by putting nails on the ground. How did she come up with this? I, I don't know, you can really just take a guess. Since she spends a lot of time nailing people, I guess she's gonna have to find more ways to get creative. Taking that into consideration, Nobara's nails would dig deeper than we could even imagine because she'd be able to actually damage a person's soul, putting her on a completely different level. And last but not least, she can use the Black Flash. So you can wrap your head around that now, can't you? Now we finally have my favorite Tekken character, Panda. What exactly would separate Panda and Nobara when Nobara would use so many insane techniques and even the Black Flash? Well, you see, Panda's brute force really just allows him to take the cake. Not only this, but he's actually very difficult to kill because he has three hearts. And knowing their locations is not even half of the battle. 
If you were to ask any genius on Jujutsu, it's quite easy to see that Panda has a lot of durability and cursed energy, with Mechamaru even being surprised that Panda would survive his Ultra Cannon attack, especially when we take into consideration that Mechamaru has a lot of cursed energy. So it's not just mere luck that Panda would have survived this attack, but for some trivia, we would all know that Panda is a cursed corpse, which allows him to have different modes of combat. And for the record, Panda would have a very unpredictable fighting style because of all the training that he's been through. With these cores, he'd have the balance type, and the balance type would be his regular, or for lack of a better word, his standard fighting style. And in this form, the game plan is actually really simple. He's just going to box you out, and that's all there is to it. If Panda wants to use a more glorified approach, he can always use his Gorilla Mode. When using Gorilla Mode, he can easily defeat you with his main strength being used for short battles meaning that he's gonna knock you out in one hit and defeat you as fast as possible. The biggest game changer here with Gorilla Mode is that every attack that he does is actually unblockable. No matter what you do to try and defend against any hit, you will still suffer significant damage because he will hurt you internally, making every single punch resonate within your own body. I don't know about you guys, but even with Nobaro using the Black Flash, I think if she were to take one of these punches, she'd be as good as dead. Her best idea would be not to get hit by them, but then again, we have Panda's cores, which he can actually fake out and pretend where the location of his actual core is. And with multiple cores, he practically has three lives. Last but not least, his third life would be the Triceratops mode, with his sister's core being active. She would have a form of immense power, with it stating she would be so shy that she would kill anyone she's up against just to hide her own embarrassment. Panda has a lot of versatility and power. These things, on top of his multiple lives and being able to fake the locations of his hearts so that he can't die, makes him a force to be reckoned with. Kirara has a really interesting ability with this sorcerer using more of a focus on its strategy and spacing above anything else. Understandably so, the best thing that Kirara can really do is keep you away. With some expertise use of his own curse technique, he can actually make it so that you can never even reach him in some of the most asinine ways possible. Getting to the bottom of this, this curse technique known as Love Rendezvous would make out a constellation, with that constellation being made with points such as Emai, Acrux, Mimosa, Genin, and Gacrux, all to make up the constellation known as the Southern Cross. Now, what is the significance of this? You see, each and every person would be marked with their own specific star. This ability may seem complex at first, but it's actually really simple. With every single person being a specific star, they would have to maintain that same point in the constellation. This curse technique makes you stay in between specific points to maintain the form of the constellation. Because Megumi is labeled with Acrux, he has to be in the position of Acrux and can't move anywhere else. Now, how exactly would Kirara mark anyone with one of these points? Kirara would mark a residual of cursed energy or a sorcerer, meaning that objects that have remaining cursed energy on them would be able to be marked and people, aka Jujutsu Sorcerers, would also be able to be marked because they have cursed energy. Now, if someone doesn't really have cursed energy, this is not going to be really that effective against them. Now, if there are objects around that have some cursed energy on them, then Kirara can easily kill somebody. For example, Megumi would have Acrux right on his body because his cursed energy would be marked. And now, you would think since all points on the constellation are being used, Megumi can't be attacked right now. But Kirara can take his own point that he marked himself with, known as Jinin, and make it so that Jinin is no longer a part of the constellation, meaning Kirara doesn't have to be in the constellation himself, and he can make this Jinin turn into an Acrux and make the objects that are marked as Acrux collapse on anything else with that same point. We have another example where Kirara marks something with Imai, and then that Imai ends up crushing Panda because Panda is also marked with the same Imai star. And these are just different ways for Kirara to use multiple objects to be sent at you to fully utilize his technique. He can move any point and put them on different things. He can take points away and 
He can unmark himself with a point completely. Really, Kirara can make it so you can't do anything in a fight. I'm actually surprised that anyone would be able to even take Kirara out. It's already bad enough that in order to defeat Kirara, you have to know what constellation you're dealing with, but you have to also find each and every point that is being marked. So you have to know how much distance you can actually cover. Then you have to find a way to actually be able to damage Kirara without Kirara deciding to go up in your face, which is just not going to happen. I just don't see anyone having the brains to really fight this one back. With that being said, the best thing they can do is really find a way to finesse and follow the specified order of the constellation itself. Of course, that's easier said than done. With the head of the Camel Clan, we would have none other than Noritoshi himself. One thing to take quick notice of is how versatile Noritoshi's fighting style really is, with his curse technique being blood manipulation. If you really want to get down to the nitty and gritty, Noritoshi would have one of the most complete fighting styles in the series. With the blood manipulation curse technique, he would have ranged options, defensive options, and offensive options for every single fighting scenario, and when it comes to attacking at a range, he can specialize with using his own bow and arrow by putting blood on his arrows and allowing them to home in on his opponents, making each and every arrow deadlier than the last. Just as a quick FYI, these same arrows are able to destroy the ceiling of a building, so their destructive force is really nothing to scoff at. If Noritoshi decides not to use any weapons altogether, he can use his flowing red scale technique, which will significantly increase his strength and his speed, putting him at a completely different level than what he was fighting at before. With his next technique, Crimson Binding, Noritoshi would completely stop all of his opponents from moving by tying him together with a bunch of blood piled into a net, making it an amazing way to get control of a fight. Not only that, it covers a widespread area. So more often than not, you're going to get caught. Another one of his projectile options would be his slicing exorcism, which would create and turn a wheel of blood into a spinning blade. And finally, his most famous attack, Piercing Blood would probably be his best ranged option yet. Piercing Blood would have insane capabilities because it would be a projectile that would travel at the speed of sound. Piercing Blood would be in its own league because it would even have the strength to damage Hanami's armor while most sorcerers couldn't even come close. If you thought his offense was dangerous, you really gotta take another look at his defense with them having reaction times that are as fast as the speed of sound. He would be able to create a blood shield that would save his life in a near-death experience. Not only that, but with his expertise on blood manipulation, he would even set up traps by making gates out of his own blood that any of his opponents would fall into. However, Noritoshi has one huge disadvantage, and this disadvantage would be the very fact that he would run out of blood and eventually kill himself in battle from using too much of his own ability. And so, he would try to circulate his own blood, only to recycle it so he doesn't die of blood loss. However, this would exhaust his body. You're probably wondering, how exactly did Noritoshi land a spot above Kirara considering Kirara's broken ability? Well, you see... Kirara would put Noritoshi at a single point when it comes to the constellation, but Kirara's biggest downfall is the very fact that Kirara would mark Cursed Energy. Marking Cursed Energy would make the same energy return to Noritoshi, much like Megumi's Shikigami. While Noritoshi tries to attack Kirara, all of his blood will simply return to him, and he will get back every single last drop of blood that he lost. And while Kirara sends different projectiles at Noritoshi, he will simply just destroy them and follow the constellations in their specified order so he can defeat the curse technique and take down Kirara, otherwise giving him this spot on the list. Up next, we'd have Mechamaru. Mechamaru has everything you need to make the ideal Jujutsu Sorcerer. With his Heavenly Restriction, he would be born with a ruined body, yet possess the potential of having very high cursed energy, making his cursed energy output above average. When it comes to possibilities, for Mechamaru, it's quite literally endless. He can fight you at a range, fight you up close, have defensive options, and much, much more. 
With Mechamaru's sword option, he can quite literally eviscerate anyone he's up against by using the claws that protrude from his arms. And he can further expand on every single technique he uses by adding boost options, which makes his speed increase and his damage because rather than just blatantly stabbing someone, he can drill into their body until there's nothing left. The same sword option that makes blades would even make a shield which can tank heavy damage from Mechamaru, making it so that his robot shell won't break in an instant. With that being said, his ranged options would be very easy, allowing him to shoot lasers from his hands that are created from cursed energy, with the move being Ultra Cannon, which dispenses Mechamaru's immense cursed energy immediately, obliterating anyone he's fighting. And if he really wants to make sure you're dead, he can use Mode Albatross by dispensing a cannon from his mouth to dispense a wider array of cursed energy that will explode anyone that comes into contact with it. He would even have an army of puppets to use at his disposal that can overwhelm and protect Mechamaru at a short notice. And if this army doesn't work, he can pull out the ace in his deck. Mechamaru can just use his Ava unit, Ultimate Mechamaru Mode Absolute, which lets him drive a giant robot. Now this robot's attack power is disgusting. With Ultra Cannon, it can shoot a year's worth of cursed energy, completely decimating anything in front of it. I don't know how anyone is surviving this if they get hit by it. One year already sounds like overkill. And if one year's worth isn't enough, he can use two years and charge it to create a miracle cannon, which destroys anything surrounding this behemoth of a robot. It's a perfect defensive option. Pigeon Viola is a ranged attack that will really mix things up. This attack homes in on any one of its targets, following them until it finally kills them. Last but not least, there would be one last thing that Mechamaru would have up his sleeve, with it being a simple domain, meaning domain techniques can be canceled out, making them lose their lasting effect and actually not even work at all. Allowing Mechamaru to stay in any fight, even if he's against someone out of his league. If you're wondering why he's so high, he's driving a giant fucking robot and domains can't work on him, Plus, he has 17 years of cursed energy at his disposal. Where else do you want me to put him? When it comes to strength, cursed energy manipulation, and strategy, Toto is second to none. With one of the simplest curse techniques I've ever seen, Boogie Woogie, just by clapping his hands, Toto can simply just switch places with anyone or anything. Giving him a tactical advantage that you really wouldn't expect. I know I didn't. Toto can simply throw a rock and put it in any position he wants to attack from, giving him a mobile advantage and an advantage in positioning in a fight. Really, you could only imagine what kind of creativity he can use when it comes to this ability. He could jump off of a cliff, swap places with whoever he's fighting, and then have them lose their life from such a great fall. Not only this, Toto would be able to use the Black Flash and... He would have a simple domain technique, making any domain used against him useless. You might say it's crazy to imagine Toto up in a fight against Mechamaru, especially when Mechamaru is using his Ava unit, but easily Toto can just teleport him outside of the robot or teleport the robot somewhere it doesn't need to be. Toto's dodging expertise is really putting him at a level of fighting that most people could only even dream of. Of course, we have the one, the only, the main character, Yuji Itadori. Yuji would be above Toto because he would have so much more potential than Toto that he would immediately break down Toto's entire fighting style, and this would happen when Yuji is lacking in most of his experience. Yuji would easily be a brute and have great and have immense speed that can back up his power. Not only would he reflexively dodge Miwa's sword attack that's supposed to hit anyone within a surface area automatically, Yuji would find himself dodging the entire attack. Yuji would be smart enough to also use the environment in any given situation so that he can adapt when his back is against the wall. He would use a tree branch and the positioning of it to make it so that Toto would never even see him coming by using the blind spots against him. And not only that, he would have more strength than Toto, with Toto himself admitting that despite Yuji being so small, he would be stronger than him. And this is all the while Yuji does not have the full potential 
of his cursed technique, let alone barely having an understanding on how to make his own cursed energy flow through his own body evenly. He would be caught into a fight where he's fighting someone with four arms and he would outclass him with just his two. Yuji's speed and reactions are just advanced to say the least. He would have enough durability to survive being punched through an entire building. He would still get up standing and ready to fight and his willpower would be nothing less of unstoppable. Yuji would casually kick through walls and have that same wall fly from the force of his kick to simply hit his opponent and not only that, he can rip a pole out of the ground like it's nothing. The only thing really holding back Yuji would be his lack of a curse technique, his inexperience, and his little understanding of Jujutsu and his lack of a domain and simple domain. Yet, despite that, he would still be able to hold his own in most fights. After all, this is the same guy that would be able to use the Black Flash back to back three times. Yuji definitely deserved this spot, and I don't think anyone can really even argue that, even with or without Sukuna. Maki is a monster, a menace, and a Toji clone in the best way possible with some of the most ingenious strategies to use when it comes to baiting out her opponents and tricking them. Even though she doesn't have cursed energy, her weapon skill alone and her strength makes up for that and allows her to kill cursed spirits like it's nothing. Her battle sense and conviction would be so good that she would come to the conclusion to break her own weapon just to be able to get one step closer to victory. She never really has to think twice about anything, yet there's one thing that could hold her back. And that is the very fact that she is more than likely susceptible to most curse techniques. However, because she doesn't have cursed energy, Kirara's ability would not be able to work on her, and most domains would also not work on her because she would have the ability to leave a domain expansion, making can't miss attacks completely useless. She would even have reaction speed fast enough to allow her to cut through bullets, and this would be Maki at her weakest. At her strongest, she would be able to fight dodge and react to a cursed spirit that is going as fast as Mach 3, making it three times faster than the speed of sound. She's not moving at that speed herself, but the fact that she can take control and process the timing of her dodge makes her nearly untouchable. And one of her strongest assets yet would be the soul split katana. With this weapon being able to bypass any durability and be able to cut the soul itself, meaning not many things can actually withstand an attack from Maki. So not only can she guarantee killing someone with a cut of this sword, but domains will not be able to work on her because she can leave the domain or not give anyone permission to have her in it. Alongside that, her reaction speed can go beyond Mach 3 or even be equivalent to it. Granted, whether or not she has to focus to do this is still something that is praiseworthy. Megumi, this is a character with a ton of potential and battle knowledge that goes above and beyond, with him really making full use of his own curse technique, aiming and using possibilities that you wouldn't even consider. If there's a situation, nine times out of 10, Megumi will have an answer for it. He can summon his divine dogs to hunt down and kill anything that he wants, he can trade over his experience if any of the divine dogs die and use totality. Meaning that any knowledge and combat skills and habits that a Shikigami has will be passed down to another, making them all the more stronger. A Shikigami can only get better and better even after dying. When push comes to shove, Megumi would even have more options when it comes to his Shikigami, with Nue being a bird Shikigami that can give him mobility options and even be used as a shield. Yes, any and every Shikigami can be used as a meat shield, and they can also allow Megumi to dodge an attack that he might not be aware of. He could even summon multiple Shikigami at once, for instance, he can use the serpent to grab someone and then use the bird to come in for an aerial attack and beat you to death. There'd even be way more combinations than this with him using frog Shikigami that can grapple opponents. He could also combine a bird and a toad and give his frog Shikigami wings. He can even go further by using Shikigami as bait and create a setup with another Shikigami attack. 
he would be able to use Max Elephant and summon it to dispense water and push his enemies away. He can have it charge his enemies, or he can just summon it directly above someone's head and crush them with its weight. Megumi would even be able to use Rabbit Escape and completely trick his opponents by hiding behind an army of bunnies. And he can just use them to run away. With his most dangerous Shikigami of all, he would have none other than Maharaga. With this Shikigami using the Sword of Extermination, its entire weapon would be enveloped in positive energy. It would decimate any cursed spirit in one hit. It would even have the ability to see any curse technique that approaches it and it would be able to deflect the attack with its blade but maharaga's real showstopper is the very fact that it can adapt to anything practically making it unbeatable with the only option to defeat it is by killing it in one single blow before it can regenerate it can even adapt much faster if you're attacking it while it's adapting Let's just say we have someone like Maki going up against Maharaga. Maharaga would cut or slice by any weapon and it would adapt to the idea of being cut. Therefore, the soul split katana wouldn't be able to cut it at all because it would have adapted to the idea of being cut at all. So cutting attacks in general would never work. And this goes for every other thing that Maharaga can adapt to. It can literally adapt to anything. It can adapt to space. It can adapt to domain expansions. It can even adapt to Gojo's domain expansion, which would put so much information into its mind that it wouldn't be able to fight. Let's just say under certain circumstances, Maharaga could be able to adapt to Gojo's domain in 0.01 seconds. There's a lot more to it than that, but I'm not going to dig into it because Really, it's worthy of its own video. Just know there's a lot of potential here and Maharaga is probably one of the worst things you could ever fight in this series. With him ultimately being Megumi's ace in the deck, there's even more that comes with him. By using an exorcism ritual, if any of the people that participate in the ritual die, both people in the exorcism will end up dying if just one of them dies. And so, Megumi can take the life of anyone that he's fighting if they cannot kill Maharaga or if they die in the ritual or if he kills himself in the ritual. Megumi could kill anyone at the cost of his own life and vice versa. There's even more of the nitty gritty that we can dig into because Megumi can use his domain expansion. Even with the domain being incomplete, he can make himself fight at 120% of his own potential just by activating it, making his 10 shadows technique way stronger than it would normally be, giving Megumi more speed, more power, and more options to use when he's fighting by using every single summon of his shadows technique at one single time. He can make clones of himself turn into a shadow, bind his opponents down, and do so much more. You should pray not to fight him when he gets his full domain. If it isn't the ragtag himself, Akari would easily be one of the strongest characters in this series with his domain expansion basically being plot armor. But before we get into that, Hakari can use many different things in his curse technique. He can cause subway doors to come out of nowhere and attack you. Really, your day would only just start getting even more worse because Hakari's cursed energy in of itself feels like a serrated bat hitting you. His cursed energy would have its own properties that would damage you just by touching it, giving him a painful head start over you in a fight. But of course, the most dangerous weapon here would be the domain expansion. With the golden boy here being the gambling tycoon he is, he would use idle death gamble. With this domain, Hakari's domain would actually work like a pachinko machine. Of course, with his own twists on it. He would have a 1 out of 239 chance of hitting a jackpot, but when it comes to an increased probability coming, with an increased probability spin, he would have a 75% chance of winning and hitting the jackpot. The odds would quite literally be in his favor. Interestingly enough, if you really think about it, you could boil it all down to a 50-50 because at the end of the day, Hakari is going to either win or he's going to lose. Quite literally, anything can happen. He can win when the odds are against him, and he can lose when everything is in his favor. But the best part about hitting the jackpot 
is the fact that he would have unlimited use of his cursed energy and he would be immortal for four minutes and 11 seconds he would never even learn reversed curse technique but his body would use it off of reflex alone and one of the best parts about using this domain is that if hikari wins a jackpot he can continuously spam his domain over and over again never giving you a chance to actually kill him speaking of these chances you would be able to kill him during a round of increased improbability but he would still have a higher chance of winning than you and if you do kill him during his increased probability run he can always redo one consecutive sequence and his death would be overruled Meaning Hakari can make it so that you don't kill him during the only window that you actually have to kill him. He's unstoppable. He's a gambling machine. I, I don't know what else to say. He's either going to win or he's either going to lose. But if he wins and keeps on winning, you're going to have no chance. And finally, we have the prodigy, Yuta Akotsu, who would be highly regarded as the next Gojo Satru because he would have boundless cursed energy and he would be able to copy any and every curse technique. He would even have more cursed energy than Satru, but his main drawback would be how much energy he actually spends in a fight. They would go as far as to saying that his cursed energy would even be endless. Maybe he's not really tapped into that full potential yet, but this would mean he would win any battle when it comes to domain expansions, simply because he has a lot of energy. Not only this, but he would have an answer to any situation in a fight because he would have a curse technique that he could just use, and he can copy his own opponent's curse technique if he fulfills the conditions to devour a piece of a sorcerer's DNA. With Rika eating Uro's arm, you would understand this. Yuta would also be very disciplined with a sword, letting him flow his cursed energy throughout the weapon, letting him slice anything that is in his path. Yet, when making full use of his connection with Rika, he would be able to use any curse technique that he's already copied. He would use Rika's complete manifestation, and he would also get a cursed energy supply from Rika herself, and this would last for five minutes. And he can use reversed curse technique which can let him regenerate his own limbs and heal his own body alongside any of his teammates. Yuta can quite literally do it all, and that's reason enough to see why he would be the strongest.